Hi. Hi. I'm Wes. Right. Um, I am a senior DevOps engineer at um, Verve, used to be called Street Team. Please don't blame me for the title, it's on my contract. <laughs> As that, I love open source, I have quite a history with it. You can find my um, usual GitHub, Launchpad, etc. online and find what I've written and a few blog posts here and there. So, what am I talking about when I talk about ops for humans? Very related to Hannah's talk, as a few put us together. <laughs> um, it's sort of the, the technical architecture and documentation side of human ops. As you can see, about well, this was just a search for learning related to DevOps. That's it. Simple search, learning and DevOps. It was actually, I think it was met methodology for um, learning DevOps, which is an example search. Um, we have about three results down, five DevOps tools you need to know. Because um, It's oh, that DevOps again. Actually, that's the wrong um, picture on that side. Ignore that one. This is a brand new talk, by the way. It's the first time I've given it. I haven't had much time to work on things recently, so you're probably going to see a lot of rough edges. Please give me feedback at the end. Um, I'm giving this talk again next month for another user group in um, London, so um, hopefully I've had them ironed out by then. So I'm um, sorry for the rough version of this. Anyway, yes, that DevOps again. The everything is about tooling. The DevOps is Docker methodology of things. What I'm talking about is infrastructure. From, that was the previous slide you saw, the other picture with the um, graph. That was a, um, this is a um, actual screenshot of a um, graph export from our production Terraform. This slides along quite far. It's a giant pancake of interconnecting AWS assets. <laughs> which um, give to any developer in the company and they will say, what? What? What's that? Um, even if you've got some speciality with AWS, uh, a relatively simple setup when you look at it can be a bit over the top. Hence talking about infrastructure. How do we design our actual infrastructure and tooling, going back to the tools again, to allow people to comprehend them? So not suffer some level of cognitive dissonance about when they come across Docker, Docker Compose, um, Heroku, AWS, um, LexC, LexD, various versions of Linux, um, various versions of Windows. All the technology and tooling that they will be smashed in the face with on a day-to-day -day basis if they're expected to do anything with ops. Um, my, my focus is on operations and infrastructure, but I'm a software engineer. Uh, I don't spend my time every day sorting out problems by searching into servers. I do spend some time doing that, obviously. But most of my time is spent writing code, or more specifically, writing documentation for my code, which does something because someone needs to come and look at it at some point. And most likely their specialism is not going to be operations or infrastructure. So how can we make that infrastructure easier to comprehend, to cognate and churn over in our brains and come up with a way of solving a particular problem? There we go, got the right slide there. <laughs> that infrastructure. There's the buzzword, right. That's the, um, this is where the tooling comes in, the, 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 the various Docker tools, um, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt, all the different configuration management systems that you can possibly use. And people will come along and do a talk and tell you that well, you should pick this tool because it is the new hotness. It does everything you want to do. It'll deploy containers to any cloud and it will build your infrastructure in seconds and your developers will love you for it. And I've had this experience recently when I suggested that we move our infrastructure to Kubernetes from currently it's deployed in Heroku, which works amazingly well for developers because they have about three commands and something gets deployed and is automatically switched over. To do the same thing with Kubernetes, there is an awful lot of infrastructure which needs setting up by someone. There's things like Dias, 
this isn't a Kubernetes talk, so I'll skim over this quite quickly, that do things like Heroku for you, but there's still a lot of things to get over and a lot of concepts to get around. There's that cognitive dissonance again of extra tooling and complexities of your infrastructure. And a bunch of the developers at Verve basically turned around and go, we don't want to go with Kubernetes. We actually tried that before. And a lot of them have a very sour opinion of Docker, purely because my pre a predecessor of mine came along and thought, yeah, get rid of all this Heroku rubbish and let's move to Kubernetes. And they basically threw a bunch of buzzwords at people, committed a massively complex pull request with, you know, a, a, something like a 10,000 line pull request with different configurations, which no one had a bloody clue what was going on because it was all technology and tooling that they had no idea about. And at the end of the day, excuse me a moment. At the end of the day, their job is coming in and debugging some Python code or Node.js or something else. It is not spending their entire day trying to get Docker to run in a specific combination with Docker Compose locally and then deploy it to a Kubernetes cluster. That's not their job. Technically, you could say it's my job, but at the end of the day, I think more of my job as being able to produce infrastructure that not just works well, but works well on a personal level to the humans that are using it. There are other operations-focused engineers in, in my company. Um, some, some work on a legacy, a legacy platform, which is going away. Some work on the new platform. Oh, actually, no one works on the new platform. That's just me, Anderson. <laughs> um, but just spending some time working on cognition of of the tooling that I work and give to them, they're focused on operations and even, and even sometimes they spend a lot of time staring at a screen going, the f is here, What's, what have you actually written? So I'm not gonna assume that anyone actually went to a school, well, probably a, quite, when you were quite young you went to a school, but you might not have gone for university. So, the school may not be real. But let's go back to the basics of development. Um, I don't know how many people here have spent any time actually developing with code, and I'm, and I'm not gonna assume anyone has, but, we'll, but let's just consider one major point of developing, especially in teams. And it's not just documentation. Let's, let's face it, for the most part, development teams are already pretty rubbish at documentation because we don't, you know, don't like write, writing prose. We like writing blocks of code which will do something and can be tested, hopefully. People are usually pretty rubbish at documentation, but something that's been drilled for the past few decades into developers is commenting your code. And comments can be added to com infrastructure configuration too. Um, a lot of tooling uses YAML. YAML has comments. Um, a lot of tooling uses th their own configuration DSL, like Puppet, Terraform, things of that variety. They all support commenting. And there's a popular school of thought in, um, in psychology around communication. So a lot of... Um, a lot of um, consultants who go to big companies and teach teams how to communicate better with each other. There's a particularly um, popular book at the moment called Radical Candor, which is all about that, about how to communicate effectively between people by basically being upfront and honest without being a dick. And one of the, thing, one of the um, concepts in that book, and is also popular in that community, is the idea of over-communicating say it and say it until someone's sick of you saying it because you know they'll say when they'll say when you when they're sick of, he of hearing it but by that point they've got the, they've got the message if you say something once for example on a slack channel you say it once it will fall into the void even if it's been pinned it'll probably fall into a, a conceptual void people will just skim right over it like they skim over ad banners on a web page but if you say something over and over again, especially for, for multiple medium, then they will eventually process that knowledge. They'll at least get some part of it in, in there anyway. And it's the same with, comment, uh, with comments. 
and documentation within code and configuration. Over comment everything, even if you yourself think it's a throwaway thing, you know, it's something that everyone should know. If you include that documentation in there, then someone will likely come along and go, ooh, I did not know this. And they'll click a link, they'll read it more on how something works. And it's probably just an innocuous line that never means anything until the day it does, until it wakes someone up at 3 a.m. in the morning with an alert and it all comes back to this piece of infrastructure which has been running for the past three years and didn't bother anyone. Comments everywhere. I'm not going to spend, as I said here, no, no one really likes writing documentation, but it is an important thing. Um, I mentioned here being available, searchable and extensible. As an example, um, and this is an example that I've used at previous companies, um, at my current company, at Verve, this was done by someone else, but we have a documentation mini site. Um, it's just a statically generated site that's generated from the Markdown in our monorepo, um, in a, in, from the docs directory, which um, I can't remember the tool that's used to generate it, but it's quite handy that every time CI runs and builds uh, fresh builds out of our monorepo, it also includes that static site, including all the documentation, which you can visit from your phone. It's got a nice, easy to remember address. It's also pinned inside Slack. Anyone can go to that site and read the important parts of the documentation that people have discussed in pull requests for the repo. Chances are it'll still be out of date a month later because that's what happens with documentation. Um, even comments tend to go out of date that way as well, but they, because they live inside code, they tend to get updated more frequently than documentation because they'll get changed usually along with the code. See all those, um, all those little caveats I give there usually, sometimes, mostly. Uh, something else, oh, sorry, um, searchable and extensible. Searchable, we get by with the fact that you can grep inside the doc, uh, docs directory. Um, if you've got micro, uh, microservices across multiple sites, uh, across multiple repos, that becomes a little bit harder, but there are ways around it. Extensible is, is it easy to come along and update your documentation? Is it easy or is it, is it comprehensible? Somewhat similar to the configurations I'm talking about. Your ability to go through and read a large Terraform configuration because it has a lot of documentation built into it, a lot of comments and links to places to go and look up those bits on both Terraform and whatever cloud it's talking to. The, um, the, the mirror of that is within documentation. Can you go in there and edit it easily and pull request it to somewhere, etc. Works quite well with, Mark, with a bunch of Matt down in a repo because a lot of Developers will now to use Markdown, and yet again, it's searchable. Code comments everywhere, I said before. Interactive scripts, which is something I will look at in a moment, um, is a, it seems, it sounds so simple that, you know, it's what we've all done before. We've built a, bun a bin directory or a scripts directory with a bunch of scripts in there that does a bunch of stuff you do over and over again, a bunch of bash scripts or Python scripts or something to do things over and over again. And why am I even mentioning this? This is, you know, going back to school 101. But what I'm talking about here is building scripts with a UX, a desi uh, with design patterns for how people will use them. There's a lot of um, blog posts and even podcasts online now about um, design ops and um, the fact that a lot of people who traditionally are UX designers and developers and not operations people are working together with DevOps communities to produce tooling which works better for humans. Going back to you know the whole point of this talk is working better for humans. There's no point having the tools in place for people to use if it's so dense and incomprehensible. Hello, Git command line. That you can't actually get around it easily if it's the first time you've used it. <laughs> I actually find the Git command line quite easy to use. That's only because I've got Stockholm syndrome. Included the um, dash dash no input there. Um, you could also um, use dash dash non-interactive or something. Probably because a lot of these scripts not only will, but should be used automatically. 
So there's a problem at the moment with our monorepo in that we have a sort of um, a, a disconnect, a disparity between what developers run locally, what runs in CI, and then what runs in production. CI and production less so, they're pretty much the same. But there are a bunch of scripts that people will run locally that never gets run in CI because they're convenient scripts for bootstrapping the environment and doing other things that are um, pre-installed in CI. Um, as part of a migration project over the past week, I've been moving to a new version of the CI um, SaaS that we use and also migrating to use more of our internal tooling so that there is parity between um, production, CI and development. And everywhere I've just been having to add dash dash no inputs because there's lots of prompts, you know, I, I'm going to blow away this database, yes no? I'm going to do this, oh, there we go. I need a um, speaker mode again on my laptop. I used to have this when I did speaking more regularly. Um, a few years ago, part of my job, I used to um, travel to lots of conferences and give talks, and I haven't done it for quite a few, a few years. I did a few, I've done a couple of user groups over the years, but um, not as regularly. I used to have a nice pro profile, which I just clicked a button, and then my laptop would no longer go to sleep as long. Anyway, this isn't a talk about um, speaking. You should um, go to one of the ones that Matt's, Matt mentioned at the beginning, the workshops. <laughs> <laughs> yes, interactive scripts sh sh will and should be used for parity because if, if a human is using them, there's no reason a computer can't use them. It's when you have things that are only used by computers that the SH1T hits the fan. So an example, I mentioned Terraform before, that's what we use to deploy a bunch of AWS <coughs> resources. It's quite a nice tool. It actually has a very nice command line interface quite easy to, um, to, to comprehend, to get, uh, to get your head around, even when you've not used it before. It's got a very nice documentation. But it's DSL, it's, it's configuration language, is a little bit, uh, it's, it's, it's special in that it's designed for exactly what it does. And if you're used to writing um, code like Python or JavaScript or anything like that, then, it's, then it looks a little bit like YAML, but it's not YAML has lots of little niggles here and there. And when you're talking about things in AWS, there are lots of domain-specific knowledge when it comes to using AWS. Um, how, how do you configure this policy to work with this um, add yes instance of Postgres, etc.? How do you configure IAM policies to allow public access to your CDN as well as developer access to other things? And all the other minutia that goes along with deploying even just a, a simple set of resources to uh, an, uh, an IAAS like AWS, SSS. <laughs> so here, lots and lots of comments all over the place, links to pretty much everything. I've included links to Terraform, uh, and this came back as, um, came back as comments on a pull request. My initial pull request just included the configuration because after, after having learned Terraform and how it worked and all of that domain-specific knowledge to it, and the fact that I already knew AWS from using it for years, I looked at this configuration and knew what it did. There was a little comments here and there, especially where there, there are rough edges in Terraform itself. Um, pretty much anything that currently has an ongoing pull request to fix, <laughs> there was usually um, a little bit of comment in there to say why I was doing something that looked a little bit odd. But um, one of the lead developers came back and she was like, well, th this looks great, but I have no idea how any of this works. And it's like, well, we have JavaScript um, projects, so we have Node.js projects with lots of Webpack configuration and other things in there, which are fairly complex and dense, especially if anyone in here has ever used Webpack. It can be like voodoo sometimes. But um, a Python developer can still come along and change something because there's good documentation built into the configuration itself. Someone who knows that technology has explained it in an easy, well, I, say, I shouldn't use the word easy, in a, in a, in a way that is, that is so I had, uh, most fluidly learned. Like there are patterns of learning here about how we all go through and we look at something and we internalize how that thing works. And we do it with all kinds of technology, all the different technologies, all the hands that went up of, of you know, learning a new technology over the last week or the last month or the last year. 
we learn over our career to learn in specific ways. And there are actually only so many ways, especially if you look at cognitive behavioural science, of how you internalise those things and the patterns and ways of learning them. And a good, a good prose writer, for example, a good, um, uh, good English editor or any, any other language, any language in fact, knows how to write something down so that someone else can use their own patterns of learning to digest that material. And it's kind of the same with comments as well. There are ways of writing down comments to digest those material. In here, the, I, I am terrible at doing this, so I've just written down this does this and then a link to the thing. But both in the system I'm configuring and the endpoint system I'm configuring, AWS, because AWS has mostly terrible documentation as it's, it's very difficult to search for things and actually figure out what the hell you wanted to find in the first place. Um, but it does have documentation for pretty much everything. There's very little that's undocumented. If something's undocumented, it usually means that the tool or API is a beta. And unlike Google, they tend to have you know, actual beta lens rather than keeping them open for years just because the developers can't be bothered to finish them off. And then going back to um, that method of wrapping things with scripts, which um, is actually a method, I'll cover more now, um, um, pushed by GitHub in their operations department, in that they build lots of special purpose scripts which do complex things with a good set of command line script, uh, switches. And they use them in their automated deployment, but first off it is always run by someone locally as a developer. So you soon find the rough edges and developers will come along and do pull requests for how these scripts work, for changing command, uh, command line switches in one particular way or another because people need to run these locally all the time, not just in production for a part of operations. So they have, you know, they have a lot of reason to make sure this works well, well for them. This is from the, um, the directory where the Terraform config is. Two of the, um, commands, two of the main Terraform commands are plan and apply. Plan will tell you um, what it thinks everything should look like and what the diff is to what everything looks like. So if you've got a set of um, AWS or um, uh, Google resources which you've asked for it to deploy and they're not there, then you'll see a diff, not unlike a um, version control diff. And apply, pretty much what you think it does. It applies that plan. It makes the, the diffs match by attempting to run API commands to change what's there to what it should be there. Doesn't always, it doesn't always work perfectly. Works, quite, works better than some systems. Um, but here I've wrapped the script now, I wrapped it with a bin slash run script. And it's like, why have I done that? Terraform has plan and, plan and apply. Why am I running things? As, uh, why do I have a bin slash run script as well? Bin slash run is um, the, the name of that script is in most of the sub um, directories and services in our mono repo. Pretty much everyone has a bin slash run because that will run the command within the environment for that application. When it comes to Python applications, that usually means um, running it within a virtual environment. It might mean passing, passing it off to a Django management command. Um, similar with um, Node.js applications, it's um, running it within the context of the Node modules. And here, bin run actually wraps a make file which ensures that ter the Terraform version that we use is available. You don't need to care about how to install Terraform on your system. Part of the reason for this is because installing Terraform on your system is downloading a binary and putting it in the right place. Be, whether you're on Windows, Linux or Mac, it's go and get this and put it here and hope that it works. So I wrapped that, made sure it downloads the right one for the right system, uh, made sure it always updates to the right version and stores it in a separate place. Um, we'll even cache the downloaded file if something incorrect happened. And we'll then run everything with the right binary and, pass it, and passes everything along to the Terraform binary itself. 
Then there's another script in here that will bootstrap the Terraform environment because there's a specific way of bootstrapping an environment for Terraform because it has to keep track of states. And these are all very spe um, domain specific things that I don't expect anyone to remember after this talk unless you already use Terraform. But the point is the engineers with good scripts and also good documentation and good commenting in the config can come along to the config, change it and then try the, to run the command without giving a crap how to get Terraform, how it's configured or, or how to do anything else. Literally the only thing they need to do is run this command and also have AWS credentials of which there is a section in the readme with how to do this manually or how to copy and paste this in here and get it for yourself. So part of the original um, concept for this talk was that I was going to use um, various use cases from various places. Some of which are here. Etsy, Netflix and GDS uh, have great technology blogs with um, lots of background on various transformative things they have done internally as a culture, technologies that they've had to effectively write from scratch to do something a specific way they wanted to do. However, these are all online on these blogs, so you can go away and read about them if you're more interested in writing tooling and infrastructure and architecture for regular everyday people. Hence my just coming up with examples from my current job and past. They are unicorns, but as is clear from the transformation of many, many companies through practices in the DevOps community, um, con uh, continuous deployment and other concepts and human ops, it is very clear that these concepts are not um, unique to unicorns. Just because those companies have a massive shed load of money behind them, massive development teams and m models which either uh, get lots of money, like Etsy, or just bend through money, like Netflix, or uh, in fact a government department, like GDS, those concepts still work for everyone else and can be cheer and can be um, can be applied you know that you're not going there's no point cargo culting uh, culting stuff because we, you've a few people in the, uh, most of the people in the room probably have examples where they've cargo culted something you know some way of testing an application some way of um, oh develop uh, of um, implementing agile and scrum for example we've pretty much all seen that go wrong <laughs> so there's there, there is literally no point in cargo culting, but consider the concepts. Uh, my personal advice is to identify the patterns, discuss, document, communicate. That comes back down to whether you're building documentation, building really good uh, comments, or over communicating changes that need to be made and ways of doing things. If, if, any, if anyone is on an on-call rotor or knows people in their team who are on an on-call rotor, over-communicating any kind of change, you will probably find yourself within the next few years getting a box of chocolate on your desk by the people who are on call. Or maybe you give yourself a box of chocolate because you're on call. Personally, I like lint, but anyway. Um, many of the unicorns, their way of um, doing this is to um, create their own tooling. Netflix have a massive um, uh, set of GitHub repos with all sorts of things from the Chaos Monkey to um, entire tools for managing a deploy pipeline. And they've de designed their, their um, technology stack effectively from scratch, not counting the fact that they run on AWS purely to do things in the way that they wanted to do it, that they wanted their teams to work and to interact with each other. But we can't, probably no one in this room can do that. We, we, we live in you know, a, a realer world where um, we have smaller teams, smaller budgets, and we want to go home to our families at the end of the day, most likely. So after you've done 
you know, documentation and communication of patterns. I'm not gonna, I didn't include CURD on the end of year. I wanted to. Uh, I spend most of my time coding, I, even if it's just writing Terraform co um, configuration or trying to figure out a way of migrating us onto Elastic Beanstalk or some other plan that's on a JIRA board. But there is no point trying to do things the way that Netflix do it. You don't have the time to code everything. There's probably features to write when it comes to developers and there's probably bugs to fix for everyone. And, and writing more code will probably just produce more bugs anywhere. But it is a goal to code most things that are reproducible and reusable. And it comes with the caveat of maintaining it. And that comes back to the concepts of over communicating and the one that hopefully everyone uses of code review. Because when you maintain something, you need to review it as a team and make sure everyone knows that, how it works. Um, the large um, Terraform pull request that I did to add um, these configurations in to show that, to um, codify how we maintain the AWS part of our infrastructure, because the majority of our team is working on Heroku at the moment. The, um, the comments that I got back were mostly positive, um, mostly just positive platitudes of, of, you know, this is great. I didn't realize we had this stuff here and I didn't realize how it worked. And actually the majority of those people didn't even know how it worked. They didn't know how the Terraform of the AWS worked completely, but they could see the patterns that were laid down there and commented. And everyone should probably give um, Wolverine some chocolates at the end of the day because he's got to get it up and save the world or appear in about five different teams at once. Um, it comes back to the maintenance of doing that code review, over communicating and making sure that you keep up with changes that will inevitably happen, even if it's in response to a bug or an outage. Um, I included a link to human ops because it's a great initiative. Um, I've included Design Ops, which isn't a link. There should be a bunch of other links on here. Design Ops is a particularly good blog post by Airbnb in which they described um, their methods of, um, of the sort of um, change and review feedback loop, which they use to make their internal tooling a lot better and usually results in them actually producing quite, quite some very good open source projects as well. Um, there are a few other, there are other few, a few other things which I've included on this slide. One of one of which is the um, uh, incident management for IT operations book, which is quite a dry title, and there are dry parts of the book. But it's a fantastic book, which I would advise anyone who's involved with um, um, with on call and monitoring and that side of things to um, give it a give it pick it up and read it. Um, it has some great parts in it as well about the feedback loop of outages, um, which a lot of people mostly have heard out are heard about as um, post mortems and blame, blameless post mortems, where you don't just view an outage or an incident. Sorry, an incident has something which occurred and that's it fixed, done, ship it, go, go home. It's, it's, a, it's a feedback loop of it occurred, why did it occur? You, you do it blamelessly because things go wrong and there is no point for him blame around. It would just produce um, a one-way trip to the well of despair for the most part. <laughs> um, and you iterate over and over again until you come back to a a change which you can bring forward in your organization, in your code base, in your documentation to try and make sure that these kinds of outages are reduced or never occur. You can never stop incidents from happening. The idea is to make it easier on people in the future to deal with those incidents. Um, the slides are up there. They're incomplete because I haven't get pushed yet. <laughs> Some of the illustrations, like these ones, were by a good friend of mine called um, Jonathan Oliver. And you can grab me and say hi after this and talk about this. Um, does anyone have any questions? Is that the book you Yes, it is. I'll tweet, I'll tweet the book out <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm 
Yeah, so I mentioned earlier about breaking stuff. So when the stuff that got broken got fixed eventually, which it is, you know, this is, this is, this is, what, this is where you know, the asking for help really made a difference. I imagine <coughs> someone else to help fix it for me because I did not know how to do it. Um, which, is good, which, is, which is a bit of a cheat, there's no reason to do my organization because of that. Um, so I did a, basically did a, the post mortem. And I wrote a fair bit of documentation on basically, okay, what's the learning here? Um, it just happens again. How do I fix it? All that kind of stuff. Amongst other things, I have a complete command line history of what the guy who fixed it did. <laughs> so I, so I, I captured that and, did, and wrote that out as part of the documentation. So, you know, there's a key thing here about capturing and learning. Yeah. Just to share. That's cool, yeah. Um, I've just got to say, you've actually come to a point that takes some people like them, like you know, twenty, thirty years in in their careers, to um, start asking for help. <laughs> and some still, and some still out. To be honest, I mean, we're all, we're, in fact, we're all um, guilty of it from time to time. Where you know, probably most people in this room have probably spent a week coding something up, um, playing around with some sort of technology only to come to a review and someone turn around and go, well, actually, we've already got this over here. Or, why did you do it this way? You could have done it in two lines over here. It's, that's, it's human. We're, we're, we, get, we get cocky, overconfident, and sometimes we just forget that, you know, there are other human beings there and they would love to help you. Of course, you're in a unique situation of not having anyone, uh, not having many people to help you. You are affected with the DevOps department. I'd get a raise. <laughs> <laughs> I would go for a raise. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that is like, definitely something I'm going to be doing. Director of DevOps. <laughs> Senior Director, Vice President of DevOps. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask a question uh, of people who are Who Has anyone uh, done any work or heard anyone in their organisation talking about the user experience of uh, of kind of engineering tooling like bash scripts and uh, DevOps tools and build pipelines and stuff like that. I've, I've definitely talked about that on occasion, but it often heads into a, into a kind of void and don't think you hear any, uh, anyone else. But they was, you know, DevOps tools shouldn't have UIs, right? They should be DevOps tools shouldn't have UIs, right? They should be scriptable and command line based. Well, a command line is a UI. Yeah. It's a user interface. Which is kind of my point. Like, so <laughs> that is a user interface. It's yeah. a user interface. And so, like, the, the kind of user experience of a script, like, you can you know, come across scripts which are horrible to use because they don't give the right kind of output and, and all that kind of stuff. Is that a thing? Is, is that, is anyone trying to do that? Right. It's, a, it's a thing that yeah. falls out automatically to some extent from having a very behavior driven, test driven approach to things because the main user interface that you care about is the error messages. And if you write through, when you write your code, every single error case, and you debug on the error cases properly, not on the, uh, not on running through the debugger or whatever, those error cases will tell you what's going wrong. And you'll see, you make sure, okay, I fix it, I make sure output is understandable, and then I go forward. Um, then you get a user interface which is, you know, they're programmers. They deal with text. Making visual tools for programming um, has a huge history of very, very bad disasters, like you know, all sorts of the visual programming languages. So making the script and thinking about the error messages and thinking about also making that command line extremely simple, always the default. It just does, you type one command, and by default, that, so for our entire system, everything. There's one command that by default deploys the personal uh, personal entire system of that developer. And if he wants to deviate from that, for example, to start doing production, each production is one change from that. Of course, he has to then log into his accounts and so on and so forth. He can't just do it back. But that kind of design is absolutely important. But you have to think that it's really, really not um, a normal UX experience that people think of as a UX experience for a developer. And 
then, okay, GUI tools, yeah, for displaying information, great. Stuff like that, but don't. So I, I guess that's part of my point, like, does anyone actually use proper user personas from user, from user experience land to characterize uh, sysadmin or developer or a kind of build engineer person? Yeah. Yeah. No, but, no, because that's, that's a lot. Um, okay, sometimes, but yeah, I mean, in the sense of having them in the user stories, but very concentratedly concentrate on actual proper user stories and agile ways of doing it, user experience very much. Right? Is anyone else? Yeah, well, I do, but I'm different because I build a tool. For um, developers and operators. I work as a senior officer, so for me, I, I really want to keep everything I do as a kind of a service for developers. I want to abstract that complexity. And I want to be an example in which user experience is very important is that uh, we do use Kubernetes in production, and people need to generate secrets. Those secrets need to be in a specific uh, uh, YMS structure. The, uh, they need to be uploaded to the back room, have all our encrypted secrets and everything. So I do want a, a developer being thinking about all the things. So what, uh, what we did is just a very simple web page, which is uh, absolutely accessible just through VPN, have everything that we need to do in terms of security, but where you can actually just put your key values instead of thinking about the YML file, instead of thinking about where is the bucket that you need to put that secret in, the encryption and everything, everything is done automatically. So you, I want to give that user experience to developers so that they, so they can, I can abstract that complexity and take it away from them to make mm -hmm. the, the, the life simple. And then yeah. everything that happens in the background is just up to me, right? Yeah, there's, there's one comment to that, though. Um, often the, the thought is to make a web page or to make a, a user interface. Very often you can completely get rid of the interaction altogether so that they no, never have to do anything. So if you've got a secret, uh, we auto-generate it inside the uh, DevOps tools or whatever and then write it into a file automatically on their machine and automatically push, for example, their SSH keys into the correct places. Oh, and they never say... You can't always generate it, right? Correct. You can't always generate it because... The yeah, exactly. Are, well, uh, it, it depends. <laughs> if I if you to use a new service, which I didn't even consider, and uh, let's say we use Twitter for chat, it goes into the Twitter platform, creates a secret from Twitter, I don't know about the secret. So uh, uh, look yeah, over there API and you chuck in well, the for You put it in and you encrypt it in file. Uh, any, more, you know, you to use it, so. any more questions for Wes? Okay, cool. Yep. Wes, thanks very much indeed. Thank you.